Uh, it's my pleasure and honor this morning to introduce Dr. Claudia Kirsch. Dr. Kirsch is a professor of neuroradiology uh, in the Yale Department of Radiology and Biomedical Imaging, um, and she's a fellow in the American College of Radiology. Uh, she was previously on staff, I believe, at Mount Sinai, um, and we were just saying how you joined uh, Yale a couple of years ago. Um, Dr. Kirsch, thank you for speaking to us this morning. Uh, absolutely, my pleasure, and thank you for that kind introduction. I'll try to explain, I have a lot of different titles. Um, so I am indeed a professor at Yale. I'm actually going to also receive um, my master's this upcoming Monday. I'm also a uh, adjunct associate professor at Mount Sinai, I still am there, which I love. And I'm also doing a PhD, uh, even though I'm a full professor at Yale. Um, one of my old uh, deans, I remember many years ago, said to me one time, well, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I remember thinking, certainly not you. So um, I enjoy learning. And I'm going back right now, working on my PhD. And although I have many titles on this slide, my favorite thing that I get to do is the ability to teach and share ideas and things that I'm working on and research that I'm working on with people such as yourself. So it's really an honor and pleasure to be here today. So let's dive in. I do have uh, some key disclosures. I am on several NIH grants right now working and using high field seven Tesla MRI, which we have available at Mount Sinai. We're building one right now. We don't have it at Yale, but we're getting there for a clinical one. I'm on additional RTH grants, also completing a core curriculum grant for the American side of Hennig Radiology. Uh, that website will be available for beta testing at the end of this month. And I also have additional uh, grants funding on research I've been doing, which I will show here today. I'm also a consultant with Promo Pictures 3D Head and Neck Anatomy. Uh, so I'll be using images from that specifically to highlight some of the key anatomy in the temporal bone. Um, I also should share that working with um, Additional people, Dr. David Zander and Olivia Commonson from uh, University of Denver, we have just made a series of educational temporal bone videos with both uh, anatomic, uh, radiologic, and diagrammatic uh, information and in going into the temporal bone to understand that anatomy. So that should be available for everyone uh, coming up shortly available on YouTube. So you can just uh, click, use, educate, and use them at any time. Um, importantly, I might mention Starbucks coffee. Uh, it's got a nice little area where the V2 and the uh, video nerve hook up and meet. I refer to it as the uh, kind of the tegopalatine fossa. I refer to the Starbucks of the head and neck because those two nerves kind of hook up and meet. It looks like a little round logo in there. Unfortunately, I do not have any uh, disclosure or anything with Starbucks, although I sit in dark rooms all the time and I drink a lot of coffee. I like to start my talks with acknowledgments. And that is, I am doing a PhD and I need to acknowledge the thesis advisors that I'm currently working with. Um, I'm hopefully completing that this year. I'm working with Dr. Ali Kurum, who is uh, developed the Neopath, which is using artificial intelligence to look at pathology in the head and neck. Uh, Professor Lambert, who's a specialist in looking at ACE2 molecular, also um, at the University of Sheffield, and Harpreet Herrera, who's a virologist and specializes in radiology, and Dr. Balanchani, who is the head of our 7T MRI lab. And I owe them all an incredible debt of gratitude as my mentors um, because I get to work with them and I learn from them every day. So I'm constantly humbled about how much I'm learning. I also, of course, want to do a shout out to all of you for inviting me to come speak to you today, including uh, John House. It's a little bit humbling when you see the name of the institution and the person there getting to hear it to you. And thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about what I'm going to focus on, which is postural tinnitus, especially in the setting of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So you're going to be wondering why am I showing a slide of, yep, this is me from back in 1982, you know, 42 years ago, because 42 years ago, I was a river app guide. And one of the most important things when you were a river app guide was to be able to read the flow of the water in the river. Um, reading that could tell you if there was a bump, you know, a rock or something underlying it because of the currents and how it was going. The worst thing you could do was misread the river and then you would flip your boat with all the passengers in it. Um, we call that your number coming up. Um, my number never came up, thank God, but that's only because I stopped being a river guide. And the reason I put that analogy, because understanding pulse of tinnitus is really key for understanding flow, especially when we look at flow, and the lateral margins of the transverse sinus. And this area obviously has venous communications in through the temporal bone, which can be transmitted and we can patients can hear that. So it can either be 
um, subjective where, you know, they're hearing it or an objective, if you can put your, um, you know, stethoscope and also hear or brewery or some sort of pulsatile uh, activity in that region. So understanding flow is critical. And especially if we need to understand the Venturi effect, which is if there is narrowing or there's changes in that flow dynamics, which we will see happens in idiopathic hypertension along the transverse sinus, it will alter that flow, which can create that kind of eddy sound or current, which we've just heard. So in this hour that I get with you this morning, we're gonna talk about idiopathic intracranial hypertension, also called pseudotumor cerebri. We're gonna see how it was initially looked at in the past, why we know that prevalence is increasing, why we can see some pathonomic, what I call imaging findings, meaning as a imager, a neuroradiologist, I might be the first one to pick up on this diagnosis where people may be unaware of it. So there are what I call just ant mini pathognomonic findings. You could say, well, what is ant mini, Dr. Kirsch? In radiology, there's an expression where if you go to the airport and you're picking up a relative, you know, just by looking at that person immediately, that's your Aunt Minnie, because nothing else looks the same. So an Aunt Minnie to us is something that says, oh my gosh, that is pretty characteristic for that disease or abnormality. And you need to kind of cue people in to look for that. And in postal tinnitus, we know specifically that you're gonna develop narrowing along portions of the transverse sinus. And there's a reason for that because the dura is weakest along that more margin. And so when you increase the pressure, it's gonna go flattening where it's the weakest, most obviously, and that's going to affect that flow related signal leading to pulse adult tinnitus, which the patients can hear. Importantly, in this disorder, you can also develop defects along the transverse sinus, along the sigmoid plates, along the mastoid roof, as well as anywhere along the skull base that lead to something called aberrant arachnoid granulations. And these are important for mental reasons. Number one, they can also affect the flow when they go into the sinus and narrow it. Number two, they can also have brain herniation into them called BHAG brain herniation into an arachnoid granulation, which can be a cause of seizures and other morbidity and mortality. But if they rupture and leak into the mastoids and these patients become secondarily infected, they can be associated with high morbidity and mortality, especially in patients with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So my key question was, what are the causes forming these aberrant arachnoid granulations that we can see here on this axial T2 MRI with this kind of high bright T2 signal, this little aberrant granulation pooching into my mastoid air cells. And I've done some research, we're about to uh, literally publish in the next month on some of the data that I found, which is pretty exciting. And I'll show a little bit of that for you about what I think the etiologies are. So let's start with obesity, right? This is looking at the CDC obesity data going from 1989, but back when I was a river raft guide in the eighties, going up to now. And you can notice that the population with a BMI of greater than 30% and then a BMI of greater over 30% markedly increased into 2009 those numbers have actually gotten higher even today. So as the obesity epidemic has taken over both worldwide and in the US, we saw a marked increase in idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And in fact, when your body weight is greater than 25 or 20% of the ideal body weight, you get an associated increased incidence of this disorder, hands down. So it's associated with obesity. Worldwide now in 2014, we can see that the US, as well as certain portions in Europe, all of these areas are developing obesity with high levels of index, and these numbers have increased even more so to 2024. What will be interesting to see is what happens now with these new GLP drugs, and they're not available for everybody, um, but it'll be curious to see what happens with the obesity epidemic with now medical kind of injectable treatments that can be used for obesity. So clearly obesity plays a major role. And in the US, we're leading this, right? We're um, incredibly over one third of our population is morbidly obese. And part of that is dietary related, right? If you're going to a state fair where you've got deep fried Twinkies or deep fried food, you're going to have obesity related diabetes and secondary idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And these patients may often present with pulsatile tinnitus. So if we look back at the historical descriptions of idiopathic intracranial hypertension, initially kind of called 
pseudotumor cerebri, because it was not a tumor, it was pseudo meaning fake, we can see that Walter Dandy actually described 22 cases over seven years. And he noticed all these patients had headaches, blurred vision, vomiting, and often presented with caplodema, where the optic nerve head could be extending into the posterior margin of the globe. Now, in these cases, this is not from him, but this is from a case treated similarly, he would try to decrease the pressure intracranially by doing a craniotomy or craniectomy, removing the bones, so the brain had more space. Um, he basically you know, didn't really know what was going on. In 1955, Foley changed the term to benign intracranial hypertension, meaning there's increased pressure, but we don't really know why. Corbett said in 1982, you know, it's really not benign. The patients might be awake and alert, but they do have complications. So he changed the name again. Then Smith modified the criteria for this. And he said, you know what? There is increased intracranial pressure. And he said, we're going to use a, a lumbar puncture. Basically there's nausea. They can have transient visual changes, papilledema. The only localizing sign is often cranial nerve six because cranial nerve six kind of gets tethered at two dural points when it goes through the petrochival confluence. So increased pressure, it's kind of affected and that's kind of the canary in the coal mine key cranial nerve. Patients are awake and alert. And he said there's normal findings on the CT and the MRI, no evidence of venous thrombosis. When I do the LP, the opening pressure is greater than 25 and the CSF looks okay, but everything is fine. So I have to tell you that people went along with this, but this expression of normal CT and MRI findings, completely wrong. There are in fact multiple findings if you know where to look. So let's talk about what those key findings are. So if you ever see this on an image, you can question your neuroradiologist and make sure they're aware of it. The first and most obvious finding are these enlarged bilateral optic nerve sheaths. And we can see when the optic nerve sheath here is measured by this little purple line is greater than six millimeters, that is almost an ant mini pathognomonic finding. And you can often see greater than one to two millimeters of CSF along that dilated optic nerve sheath. And because it's so dilated, often kinks and gets a little curved. So classic greater than six millimeters is the key cutoff finding that we use. And that's a pretty obvious finding you can see on any axial T2, both CT or MRI. Because it's so enlarged, it often kinks, as I said here before, and you can see that that posterior globe is flattened. Normally the angle should be 150, it's pushed out, and now it's 180 at a flat angle. You can see that that flattened posterior globe, as I showed here, will also show inversion of the optic nerve head into the posterior globe with restricted diffusion, as we see on this axial ADC MRI. That is papilledema. And you can see that papilledema as this bright area of signal from that restricted diffusion in that trapped fluid within that inverted optic nerve head along that posterior globe. So on the left here is the ADC, on the right is the DWI showing that bright trapped signal within that optic nerve head with papilledema. What's fascinating to me is when you look at astronauts who go into outer space, they all develop the same thing because they lose the normal function of gravity that helps with your normal CSF flow and the normal clearance of the G lymphatic. So they come back and they just have focal dilatation, not the entire optic nerve, right around the distal optic nerve head and develop a little papilledema. Same thing is seen in idiopathic intracranial hypertension because the normal ability of the CSF to flow is disrupted when you go into outer space and you don't have gravity kind of helping keeping everything in balance. So we look for that flattened optic nerve head and because cranial nerve six is affected, they lose that ability for controlling the lateral rectus and they often have disconjugate gaze. So one globe goes the other way and the other and the globes don't coordinate very well. The other classic finding on a sagittal T1 is this partially empty cella. So because of that increased CSF pressure, the normal diaphragm cella gets pushed away. The CSF pushes and flattens the pituitary along the inferior margin of the cella turcica. Here we can see that flattened posterior globe, so it looks like a flat line, and then the optic nerve head inverted again into there, consistent with papilledema. So if I see these three findings, I am pretty much certain that this patient has increased idiopathic intracranial hypertension. I immediately recommend fundoscopic assessment because they can go blind over time, which is a horrible morbidity and mortality to have, and something you don't want to have happen in these patients. Because of that increased pressure, 
And you will often see these patients, what I, are, what I call them is T1 weighted. There's a little bit more fat. So T1 on um, fat is bright. So I, I use the term T1 weighted. You can just see that they're a little more T1 weighted, disconjugate gaze, and that increased pressure will flatten often the less dominant transverse sinus at that normal weakened point of the dura. So here we can see narrowing along that venous portion in this patient. So I also want to clarify when we talk about idiopathic intravenal hypertension, the correct terminology, because I see this misspoken quite a bit as well. By definition, it is something that does not have an identifiable cause. So you can have primary, which we now tend to refer to as idiopathic, meaning we don't know, although I think I have a reason and, and I know why this occurs. So we're still referring to idiopathic intravenal hypertension. We'll see after my publication if we have a, a better term for this. If there is an identifiable cause, it can usually be from either venous thrombosis, which can also narrow that sinus, and classically medications can also do this, as well as underlying medical conditions. So if I hear the term idiopathic intravenal hypertension from a secondary cause, that's an oxymoron, right? It, that doesn't exist. We know there's a cause. We don't refer to it as idiopathic. I don't use the term benign intracranial hypertension because I've treated a lot of patients and there's nothing benign about this disorder. They can go blind. There can be high morbidity and mortality. This is not a benign disorder. If left untreated, CSF leaks can have incredibly high morbidity and mortality. So what do I need to make this diagnosis? Well, first off, papilledema. That's the first clue. And that can be easily done on a fundoscopic exam, or I can see it pretty quickly on imaging. I don't even need a fundoscope to tell me this patient's got inversion of the optic nerve head, flattening the posterior globe. This is papilledema. If they're a little bit more T1 weighted, I'm immediately raising the alarm that this is likely idiopathic and cranial hypertension. The key cranial nerve, as I said before, is cranial nerve six. On imaging, I need to exclude that there's no mass that there's no venous thrombosis. There's no structural abnormality causing this. I had a patient with similar findings from an orbital meningioma. So that meningioma was blocking the CSF and the flow of the fluid from the optic nerve into the optic canal. That is not idiopathic intracranial hypertension. It has a cause. I need to rule out those masses and then I make sure I can make that diagnosis. When I do my lumbar puncture, the CSF is often normal and that elevated pressure is greater than 250 milliliters of CSF or 25, kind of the key number. So if it's elevated and often that shoots so high, it's difficult to measure that pressure. The patients often feel immediate relief after remove a component of the CSF. That's like another mini kind of finding. Now, if I don't have papilledema, I can still make this diagnosis if I can see a cranial nerve, especially cranial nerve six. So this is the course of cranial nerve six. If I have this elevated pressure, if either unilateral or bilateral cranial nerve six palsy, that is pretty much almost pathognomonic because they may not always have papilledema. If absent papilledema and no cranial nerve six, if I see three imaging findings, I can again suggest the diagnosis. And that is if I see a partially empty cella, if I see that flattened posterior globe, and I see that distended enlarged perioptic space, especially if my optic nerve sheath is greater than six millimeters. And if I see narrowing along the transverse sinus, it is highly likely that they have idiopathic intracranial hypertension, meaning now we're concerned about visual loss and we need to reduce that pressure. And they often put them on acetazolamide and we try to take some fluid off to reduce the pressure as quickly as possible. So why is it happening, right? We know it's related to obesity. What, what is the deal? Why do patients have this? Well, we tried to take a look at what was going on and using artificial intelligence, I said, well, you know, when we have fat, and if you, if you ever go to a fancy French restaurant, you often order things like foie gras or sweetbreads or things. And if you know about foie gras, it tastes good because there's a lot of fat in it. So your body is incredibly dynamic. We store fat if we gain it everywhere in our body, including the liver. Why not also store fat in the brain into the white matter? And that was one of the key questions I had is, are there changes in the overall white matter volumes in patients who have idiopathic intracranial hypertension? And can we measure that? And can we determine if that changes with body mass index? And I have to tell you, we've done now two major studies on this, and it's pretty, pretty exciting. You're the first two I get to share this with internationally. So we're sending out, uh, we have a symposium presenting this work at ISMRM, and I'll share you some of the key findings that we saw.
So we looked at idiopathic intracranial hypertension. We took patients and specifically using artificial intelligence, analyzed whole brain volumes. Then I looked specifically at gray matter volumes, which is the outer cortical margins here in blue. And then I specifically looked at white matter volumes here in this kind of light aqua blue. And then I correlated these with body mass index, opening lumbar pressures, uh, BMI, fat measurements, everything I could do. And I had a grant funding for this and it was a very interesting project. So I actually had a few patients and I had, and I also matched these on each patient that I had to a normal kind of age match control and comparing white matter, gray matter volumes, and then looked at different age groups because we also had a pediatric cohort. So here's the key finding. As I said before, we know that that Venturi effect is likely from any changes in the normal flow related state of my venous system. I know that when I look at my sinuses, especially my transverse sinus, that that transmits into the ear. So if there's any narrowing, which can be caused by that weakest point where I expect it to be flattened, it'll likely lead to pulse of tendinitis. So let's take a look at what we found. Using our data search, we pulled up 50 MRIs, we retrospectively analyzed these, excluded any patient with a mass, and we also went back to de-identify them. So it was completely blind and then use an uh, automated software segmentation to look at the white matter, gray matter, whole brain volumes, and then took age match controls. Now, this was interesting and we did a blind. So we wanted to compare these without knowing and then reanalyze the data because I did not want to be biased in my analysis. And here's the interesting thing. When we started going through the patient charts pretty carefully, we had about 14 pediatric patients and then we had about 30 adults. And then we had a couple of patients over the age of 60. Now, what was interesting is when we broke these down, we actually found that in the pediatric cases, when we looked carefully, several of these patients have been put on antibiotics for various reasons. Now, antibiotics, as you may well know, back in the 30s, were discovered by accident when they gave it to animals in feedlots to make them fatter. However, it's affecting the gut biome, it makes people fat. So when you put kids on antibiotics for too long, they also gain weight, and that's the known basically published scientific fact that antibiotics destroy the normal gut, uh, gut biome and are linked to weight gain. So because we could find a cause of several of these pediatric patients, we basically excluded them from the idiopathic etiology because we knew that there was a cause, drug-related, but we still measured the gray and white matter volumes, so but we didn't use them for the idiopathic analysis. We had one adult, it turns out, who had recently developed adult acne and had been put on some of the um, vitamin A medications as well, which are also known to cause um, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So I had to remove that, as well as any patient on lithium, which is a known cause for causing increased gray matter in pediatrics. And then one other adult male was put on um, antibiotics just as well. And because we knew that was the cause, we removed them from the analysis. So Avoid antibiotics if you can for long-term because we know it causes weight gain. Interestingly, it did affect the overall dynamic changes in the brain. So when we looked at this, we then did a T-test and paired samples as well as histogram and box plots. So I'd like to share with you some of the data that we found. When we looked at specifically in the age categories, we found that in the pediatrics, it was an overall increase of gray matter relative to normal gray matters in younger patients. In adults, it was specifically, um, on all of these, if the lines are above zero, are statistically significant. So every single one of these is above zero quite considerably. And um, pediatric, it was gray matter volumes increased relative to white matter volumes in the whole brain. In the adult group, as it transitioned from teenagers to adults, it was specifically white matter volumes. And then in the older patients, basically because it was an overall shrinkage of whole brain volumes, it artificially elevated both the gray and white matter. So that might be an artificial elevation, which is pretty striking. So when we map this out again, looking at pediatric, kind of showing here specifically in blue, these gray matter volumes were really quite striking relative to the normal gray matter volumes here in the gray. And then the white matter, when we matched them to the adults, as people transitioned from teenagers to adults, had elevated white matter volumes relative to the normal values as they became more and more adult. So it was kind of a fascinating finding. In overall adults, again, it was more the white matter ratios that were significantly elevated compared to normals. 
And then in anybody over age 55 to 60, whole brain volumes went down and there was an artificial elevation in both gray and white matter volumes. So we especially saw in seniors that the overall brain volumes, and there could be secondary factors, right? These patients can be diabetic. They might have hypertension. The whole brain volumes would go down. And then the overall white matter, gray matter volumes looked artificially elevated, but that might be kind of an artificial increase. So kind of a fascinating initial secondary finding, but we kind of discarded that. So this was looking specifically at the ones we knew had drug-related changes and in tetracycline, especially in the pediatric patients. Here we can see that the overall in blue gray matter volumes increased markedly relative to the normalized gray matter volumes here in gray. On lithium, same finding, especially in pediatric patients, it was gray matter volumes significantly increasing. And then adults on antibiotics, um, it was always the white matter volumes that increased. So it was kind of an interesting transition thing we noted on our preliminary data. So we normalized these and then saw if there was p-value significance. And it was pretty significant for gray matter in the pediatrics, for white matter in adults, and then loss of whole brain volumes, which we felt had a secondary effect in anybody over the age of 50 to 55. So that kind of smaller subset, the power in that is not as strong as I would like, but overall we see that as a trend in patients who get older. So we had a few patients, not a lot, but a few that were quite fascinating. And I had one patient that started out initially as a normal weight, and this is the axial T2 MRI. This patient, you can see here is the normal ratios of the gray matter, the white matter, and the CSF. So the CSF I've kind of put here in dark blue is about 25%. White matter was about 34%, gray matter about 41%. This patient at one point became obese. Uh, you can see the same exact patient um, within, this is all within about a two year period. And you can see obviously the increased deposition of subcutaneous fat here. Notice you've got the increased uh, orbital uh, sheath increased here with that increased perioptic CSF, flattening of the posterior globes. And we were able to measure the gray and white matter volumes. And we could see that the gray matter volume increased, but the white matter volume also increased. And the overall amount of CSF space or interest fluid CSF space decreased significantly here from 25 down to 14%. This is a tight brain compared to the other one. Now, fascinatingly, this patient became anorexic and then lost a lot of weight. And we repeated the MRI brain and the analysis. And this is fascinating. I don't have a lot of cases of patients to do this, but we're now trying to collect, uh, look at a bariatric series of patients who lose weight. And you could see that fascinatingly here, now we've actually lost the volumes of both the gray and the white matter. And we've increased the fluid in the intrasuperal space here to about 29%, all within the same patient. So quite striking to me, showing that how dynamic the brain can change based on weight or body mass index in any patient. So let's now go back to looking at how does this relate to the ears, which is what you guys deal with, and postal tinnitus. So we want to understand that dura, right, is along those venous sinus margins. And here we can see it creates that superior sagittal sinus, that nice kind of tentorium, creating that triangular space with the straight sinus coming into those transverse sinuses. So we can see that from that origin, you've got dura coming from that original crystalgali going back, it kind of enlarges posteriorly to the horticular rophily. And you can see that it terminates along that occipital protuberance. And you've got that dilated torcula, which kind of from the term wine press, where it all kind of has that confluence of the sinuses before going into the transverse. Now, the superior sagittal sinus usually goes in the dominant draining right, not always, but the majority of time. And then you often have dominant drainage from the straight sinus going toward the left. Now, when we look at that drainage of the sinus, we can see that there's obviously associated veins from occipital diplogue veins. You also have inside the superior petrosal sinus, and that also drains toward the sigmoid sinus. So there's multiple venous collaterals, and these can be tremendously variable. Now, if we look specifically here at the right transverse sinus, as I said before, it's usually a continuation, as we see here, of my superior sagittal sinus. And that's just how nature normally drains us when we're in utero. And then often a smaller, but it can be variable into the drainage of the left transverse sinus, continuation from the straight sinus. Now, when you have increased pressure, it's going to flatten the areas that are weakest because those 
weaker areas of pressure are just going to be the most susceptible to any sort of pressure changes in the brain. So it's going to flatten that. And we can see that it goes down into the internal jugular bulbs. But we also know that infibrotrosal sinus receives a whole series of little labyrinthine veins along the internal ear. And these will go through that cochlear canaliculi and they will head toward the vestibular aqueduct. And they will also drain toward the brainstem and the lower cerebellum. So any pulsation transmitted back into there can be heard as the patient as a pew, 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 or pulsal dial tinnitus. So you can transmit that flow back into those areas because it's all connected. So we mentioned before those key radiographic findings, the empty cella, that narrowing of that transverse sinus. We can often see that pressure might push the tonsils down a little bit into the frame of magnum, also tightening that space and creating more pressure because now the CSF can't flow freely through the frame of magnum. But because of this increased pressure, it can also lead to bony erosive changes along the skull base. And those are critical findings we can also see on imaging because they lead to small little meningocele's and importantly, they lead to CSF leaks, especially in the temporal bone region with high morbidity and mortality. So let's take a look. If we look at a skull base of somebody who's got idiopathic adrenal hypertension, it looks like it's moth-eaten because of these aberrant arachnogranulations. And as I said before, importantly, they can occur along those sinus margins and the mastoid complex. So we here can see a beautiful arachnogranulation with little pits kind of eroding right into the bone along this area. So let's talk a little bit about the skull base and what's going on here. If I look at a nice, beautiful, normal skull base, the way I like to think about it is like a lady's fancy high heel. You have this nice frame and ovale, which is the front part of the opening of the shoe here, which would be the sole. And then the little spiky frame and spinosum, the little spiky portion of the heel. And it's nice and smooth for that middle cranial fossa, anterior cranial fossa, temporal bone, beautifully seen, and that posterior cranial fossa. When I look at my patients who've got idiopathic intracranial hypertension, it's like someone took an army boot, right? It's punched out everywhere. And all of these arachnoid granulations put the patient at risk for morbidity and mortality. So let's talk about that. We can form these spontaneous CSF leaks. We see them most commonly, again, in patients at risk for idiopathic intracranial hypertension, obese, usually middle-aged women, usually childbearing age, and many times there's increased intracranial pressure, right? So importantly, we're gonna focus on the temporal bone region because this is the area that I love and we've just published in this past year why it's important not to miss these because missing them often has a high incidence of morbidity and mortality, with repeat and current infections associated with these skull-based defects. And we published this in a value-based article just recently in the skull-based journal. So pay attention, especially in your obese patients for these defects that can form because they're easily missed. They're often slow leaks. So the fluid is not that great. It's just a slow kind of pulsing leak in through that area and they can cause major problems. So pay attention to the roofs where they're thinnest and weakest. Here we see another beautiful example. So this is the one I showed before. Here's this large one on the right, but notice there's a small one also here on the left going into the mastoid. There's a little bit of fluid in the mastoid cavity on this thin section axial T2. As I said before, it's a slow leak, but if they become super infected, they can have high morbidity and mortality. So why are these occurring, right? what's creating these aberrant arachnogranulations? Well, they are going to often occur adjacent to pneumatized structures along the skull base. And that includes, as you see here, my sphenoid sinus, which is beautifully pneumatized. And you get a variable pneumatization, as you know, of your sinuses. It occurs along those lateral sphenoid sinus margins and along the floor of the middle cranial fossa, as I showed, and of course, along that temporal bone but they like to really form along areas where there's sutures or any margins along the skull base. And we know if we've got a pneumatized sphenoid that I have the openings for foramen rotundum and the Vidian canal, and those areas can be thinned and create this artificial, what they call the Sternberg canal, which is to me just usually a pneumatized sphenoid with a prominent rotundum or Vidian, and that erosive pressure creates another little defect and a leak, which we often see. So these granulations, if you remember from medical school, are termed peconian or other name for them, 
from Antonio Pecconi, who did these beautiful drawings. He was an Italian anatomist. He wrote about the dura mater back in 1705, and he published these drawings of these little outpouchings that occur all over along the dural sinuses. Now, we know these openings are designed to drain my CSF. They are formed when we're in utero about 35 weeks. They're often too small when we're born to see, but they increase in size and number as we age. Now, if we look at these little openings, these arachnogranulations, we can see on an electron micrograph that basically they're formed from little collagen fibers with these little circular lining pores. So it's like a little drainage system for your CSF. And this drainage system is occurring all over, but classically up along the superior sagittal sinus, allowing for, I think, what are called the classic, or I call it cartage or plumbing of the brain. Your CSF is normally flowing. When we sleep at night, we know that's really important for like the G lymphatic and CSF clearance. It's kind of flushing all the things out of the brain, draining up these little pores, and then back into your venous system. Now, these classically occur right along that superior aspect of my superior sagittal sinus. Now, they often have this little cap. That cap fuses with the endothelial lining of my venous sinus, and allows that CSF fluid to kind of drain away and drain away all the stuff that we see along the CSF. So an important drainage system that we never think about, which is occurring every time we sleep. However, when I have idiopathic adrenal hypertension, I often form these aberrant granulations. They don't reach a venous target, right? They're forming along the skull base and floor and anywhere where there's any sort of weakening of the bone and they can lead to leaks. Those leaks, especially in the temporal bone region, can cause infection, inflammatory change. They can also often go into the sinus as well, narrowing the sinus, again, causing that venturi effect, leading to pulsatile flow and pulsatile tinnitus. So two major causes of pulsatile tinnitus in idiopathic adrenal hypertension. So I'm going to kind of wind through again everything I said, because there's I once heard this, when you give a talk, uh, say what you have to say. Uh, tell everybody key points, and then go back and repeat it again so we can go through those key points again. We know that idiopathic intracranial hypertension is clearly associated with obesity. We know that as the obesity increased worldwide, so did the incidence of this disorder. And this disorder is often associated with pulsatile tinnitus, which is what's going to come present to you at the house clinic, and any of your patients are complaining of this, like a pshew, pshew, pshew. And if you go on the internet or anything, you can see that pulsatile tinnitus is a major problem for many patients worldwide. But we know it is clearly associated with obesity. We know that it occurred in the past, but the overall incidence in the past has definitely risen, as has the obesity index. We know that is increasing because obesity is increasing. We know that there are imaging findings which are pathognomonic. We look for that partially empty cella. I look for those dilated optic nerve sheaths, greater than six millimeters with more than one to two millimeters of perioptic CSF along the optic nerves. Flattening of my posterior globe, the globe angle should be 150. If it's flattened to 180, I'm worried about papilledema. If there's inversion of the optic nerve head into the posterior globe, that's papilledema that can be seen on imaging and they should be going for a fundoscopic exam to exclude idiopathic intracranial hypertension so they don't end up with resultant blindness. We know that it's going to flatten the weakest area of the sinus, which is along that lateral margin of the transverse sinus and cause narrowing along that sinus. We know it's also going to form aberrant arachnogranulations along the skull base, along the mastoid, and into the sinuses as well, which can disrupt the flow of the sinus, leading to that venturi effect and pulsatility with flow, which can be heard again as pulsatile tinnitus. We know, in fact, when we see that instance of obesity, we should be paying attention if our patients are obese. And it's a hard thing to discuss the patient about, but it's changing now with the new GLP ones. And there should be an overall decreased incidence, we hope, with these new drugs. We'll see. In our study, we looked specifically looking retrospectively. And I have to tell you, we also did a prospective study using PreSurfer. And we found the same findings in a large cohort of patients on 7T. What we found is the brain is dynamic. Your body mass index can affect the size of the brain. In young patients, it was more gray matter in pediatric patients. In patients as they transitioned from teenagers to adults, it was the white matter changes that tended to be more affected as patients became obese. We also have uh, a few patients, as I said before, with uh, bariatric weight loss, where we saw the white matter decrease down and then the increased CSF spaces. So the brain is dynamic. We know that 
obviously we can measure this using artificial intelligence. And we saw specifically in pediatric patients, greater specific significance of the gray matter relative to whole brain volumes. And adult patients, as I said before, greater than, you know, over, I'd say 16 to 19 and above, it was white matter. And then older patients, there was overall brain volume loss, probably for multifactorial reasons, but then the overall white matter, gray matter volumes were artificially increased. So to me, most critically in the childbearing ages of, you know, to the 20s to about 50s, it was the white matter, which was significantly increased, decreasing the overall CSF space and ability for normal kind of CSF loan drainage in adult patients. And as neuroradiologists, we, and especially imagers, helping you guys when you interpret patients who might have this, we really need to pay attention to any sort of these radiographic manifestations that help us identify this disorder because the patients may present with the pulse dots in this, but it's important to exclude this as part of that differential. On imaging manifestations, we importantly, when we look at those sinuses, know they're interconnected. So disruption of flow from either that increased pressure flattening that transverse sinus along the lateral margins or from formation of those aberrant granulations into the sinus are going to cause disruption of the normal flow with the venturi effect, causing that pulsatile tinnitus, which can be transmitted back into the ear and heard by the patient. So important to look for these and pay attention. Many people blow them off and say, oh, aberrant granulations, they can cause problems because not only can they disrupt into the mastoid with slow CSF leak, but they can also sometimes along the temporal region have brain herniation, which can be associated with seizures as well. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of time always at the end uh, for offering uh, questions, and I love feedback. I look forward to hopefully meeting you guys all in person, coming out to LA, sharing a cup of coffee with any of you at any time, and you can all unmute, and I, I welcome feedback and any sort of uh, response to the questions. It's hard to interact because I'm not there with you, but virtually feel free to all unmute and ask questions, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you this morning.